All right, let's go ahead and get started this morning, and I'm going to, I'm not going to fight the rain, I'm just going to roll with it. Is that all right with you guys? I'm just going to roll with it. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32. I want to share something briefly with you this morning. Here we're going to receive the Lord's Supper and communion together here in, uh, before we leave today. But, uh, but before we get to any of that, I, I really uh, was impressed yesterday just on my heart. The Lord just really stirred my heart toward, uh, let's just take some time this morning and pray uh, for some people. So I, I feel like there's some things the Lord wants to do. I feel like there's some things the Lord wants us to pray through and to, uh, to pray into our lives. And so, uh, so we're going to get there here in just a few minutes. But I want to kind of set this up with something the Lord put in my heart, uh, I believe is going to speak to us this morning. So you ready? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I invite you right now to come just like this rain and to pour out the word from the mouth of God, the preceding word of God, the creative word of God would be poured out over us today. That's our prayer. Lord, I invite you to come and to do whatever you want to do. Lord, move us out of the way, move our agendas out of the way, our plans out of the way. Lord, may we be submitted and completely yielded to your spirit and to your way today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start off this morning, I want to read through um, a a little portion of scripture here, but let's just set it up. Um, If you remember, God sends a man named Moses to Egypt to bring out his people, the the Hebrews, the the sons of, of Israel, to bring them out of Egypt, uh, Egyptian captivity and bondage. And in, in a mighty show of God's power, how many of you know that God's powerful? How many know that God loves to show His power? He does. He loves to show His power. God is a God of power. And He shows His power. He shows His strength. In fact, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro. They're going throughout the whole earth looking for someone on whose life He can show Himself strong. He can demonstrate his power. Do you know that, that in, in 1 Corinthians that Paul tells the Corinthian church there, he says, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with a man's wisdom, with words uh, uh, of man's wisdom, but I came to you with a demonstration of the spirit and power. God is a God of power. And when God shows up, there's going to be power. Hey, I don't care how big the church is. I don't care how great the programs are. I don't care how much offering comes in. When God shows up, there will be a demonstration of power. Amen. So, so many people in, in our culture, and whatever, for whatever reason, have, have bought into a lie that God doesn't show his power anymore. And, and, and they don't believe that, that the God of the Bible actually shows himself to his people anymore. And I've, I've even heard it said this way before, that it's, it's easier to believe in a God that you can't see than a God that you can It takes more faith to believe in a God that you can see than a God that you can't. Hello? You hear what I'm telling you? When God shows up, we begin to reason it away. When God begins to do something in our midst, we begin to reason it away. We begin to figure out, okay, well, that was really this or or this was really that. And I'm telling you what, man, call it whatever you want to. But man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live the life that naturally automatically assumes if it happens it, and, and it's supernatural, then that was God. Amen. It was God. He showed up. God did it. I'm going to give him glory for it. I'm going to give him praise for it. I may not understand it. I may not have a box for it to cram in it in my life, but I'm going to believe it's God and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank him for showing himself to me, for revealing himself to me. I, I don't know what it is, but something's gotten stirred up in these last few weeks. And, and uh, to, I mean, we, we've been having some, some really supernatural things happen, both in our church and in our lives. Uh, myself and my wife, we've, we've just been experiencing some things with God that we've not experienced before, hearing some words from the Lord that we've not heard before. And, and it's kind of got us going, man, what is this? Like, kind of like the, 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 the children of Israel in the wilderness, when, when God rained down the bread of heaven on them and they looked at it and they said, what is this? Manna what it means what is this it's it's a wonder it makes you wonder it's a sign that makes you wonder right signs and wonders God wants to do something in our midst that causes us to live and to dwell in the wonder of his glory where we are all day every day consumed by the wonder of God listen that is the fear of the Lord that is the fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord is an an everyday consciousness of his presence that that 
I know he's with me because not because I, I, I sentimentally believe that because Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I, it's not a sentimental belief system that's causing me to know that he's with me. I can feel him. I can hear his voice. I can see him do things in my life. I can see him moving in my life. I'm finding this out that the only people that don't see God move are the people that aren't looking for it. Amen. Yeah? The only people that don't see the power of God are the people that aren't looking for it. But it's something about when we turn our eyes and we begin to see him and we begin to focus on him, we begin to give him our attention, God shows up. And you're like, man, has this been going on all along and I've just been missing it? Probably. But I don't know. Maybe it's just that once we fixed our eyes on him, he said, okay, now I got your attention. Let me show you who I really am. Let me show you my power. I believe if this church would get our eyes on Jesus, begin to see him as he is, we will see the power of God on display on a regular basis. It won't be some random thing for God to show up and move. No, it'll be every time we gather together, the sick will be healed, the lost will be saved, demons will be cast out, miracles, signs, wonders. We will experience the power of God. Some people say, why do we need that? Because that's who he is. Hey, well, we, don't, we don't need all of that. We got all that in the Bible. But let me tell you something. This was not a, a, a historical record for us to look back on and say, oh, well, that's so nice. I'm so glad that happened in the days of the apostles. You know what they, that word in there is for? To make us jealous. Because when we read the scripture and we hear about how God moved and we say in our lives, I'm not satisfied with anything less than what I know God can do, then you know what that does is it stirs up faith. And it stirs up expectation and it puts our eyes on the one who can do the impossible. I don't believe, do you know that Jesus said, Je I didn't plan on preaching this morning, but here you go. I, Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. The first thing he said that should follow you as a believer. This is Jesus' description of the lifestyle of a believer. The number one thing he said, what did he say? They shall cast out devils. It's the first thing that'll happen. I don't, I don't know about you, but there's something that needs to shift in our perspective of both who he is and who we are because I don't think that our lifestyle is lining up with who he says we should be. Amen. And I'm not, I'm not trying to get everybody all looking for, you know, but I want us to get our eyes on him. And when we begin to see him, we're going to see his power. We're going to see his glory. We're gonna, I don't, how, can you, how can you go to church and not expect miracles? For, for the God of miracles. I mean, we're gathered in his name. And Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, that will be done for you. If there's no miracles, then what God are we talking to? You hear what I'm telling you? I'm thinking the church better wake up that God's called us to walk in the supernatural and to experience his power I've been around church my whole life, and let me tell you something. This is one thing I can tell you more certainly than I'm standing in this room right now. Preaching doesn't change anybody or anything. I've been in church my whole life. Preaching will not do it. Neither will programs, neither will songs, neither will great bands and musicians and worship leaders and songs. None of it will. That changes nobody. You might get an emotional fix for a moment, but life transformation is a work of the power of the Holy Spirit. Hello? It's a work of the power of the Holy Spirit. And living a powerless Christianity is inexcusable in the days that we live in. It's inexcusable. I, I, I feel this holy frustration with powerlessness. I feel this holy frustration with living religious Christianity in a mediocre way, in a, in a monotone sense where there's no passion, there's no fire, there's no power, there's no healing, there's no deliverance, there's no mighty salvation. And I'm, I'm tired of seeing people come to church and leave the same way they walked in. I'm tired of seeing people that are bound up with religion still come up and, and, and bound up as ever and we can't do nothing about it. I'm tired of that. Like I, I have a, a holy frustration on the inside of me because I know who he is and the way we're living right now is not reflecting the goodness of our father. It's reflecting the religious system of man. The goodness of our father is the power of God on display. Listen to what Paul said and just while you're there in Exodus 32, um, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. I read it, or I, I quoted this just a minute ago but let me show you something else that he said. 1 Corinthians Chapter uh, 
4. He says this, or I'm going to read chapter 2 first to you. Chapter 2, verse 4 says this, says, uh, or verse 3, Paul's telling the, the Corinthians church, he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. In other words, I didn't come to you because I had it all together. I came to you in the fear of the Lord with weakness and trembling because there, I was in awe of his presence. I, I believe, I believe that God is, is going to begin to show up in the body of Christ again. And God's going to begin to show up in the body of Christ again in a way that might scare some people. It might just scare some people. In fact, I I, I was just listening to this week, I was listening to testimonies of of when revival fell both in Toronto and in Brownsville at the the, the church there in in Pensacola, Florida. And and, uh, both pastors giving an account of when revival, when the glory of God showed up in those churches. And if you've not heard of those revivals, I dare you to go listen to some of the teaching from those revivals and hear some of the things that were going on in those days in early 90s or uh, mid 90s. And and both of these pastors attested to this. They both said this, that when when the glory of God hit, that some people, they, 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 they flocked to it because they were so hungry for the power of God. But initially, it was such a scary moment that people ran for the doors. And I'm, I want you to know something. If God shows up in His glory, if this thing's going to get serious real quick, it's going to get serious. And we're not going to be playing games, showing cute videos and, and trying to entertain people so they'll show up for church. We're going to see God's power and there ain't going to be no playing games about it. It's going to get serious and people might run for the door and I'm okay with that. Amen. I'm okay with that. Amen. I'm going to read to you a story here in just a minute, man. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me read one more passage of scripture to you. When he said, I wasn't with you in strength, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of man's wisdom. You hear what he said? I didn't come to you with persuasive words to try to change you with how well I could talk. I'm not trying to change you with some great new revelation that I've had from the Lord. I'm not trying to change you with some sort of persuasive argument. I want you to know the true transformation is going to come in a different way. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God that's where your faith it needs to be we're not hey don't have faith in in in, in how uh, how how the church functions have faith in God and how God's functions how God shows up in power amen that's the only hope we've got people we need the power of God amen. we need it in this church desperately amen. we need the power of God I'm I'm just like to this point and I'll be honest with you like I'm, I'm willing to abandon it all for the glory. Like, nothing else matters. I want you to get that. Nothing, if God doesn't show up, and if we do not experience the power of the one who created us, then this experience in this building is never going to amount to anything. Amen. It won't. 1 Corinthians 4 Verse 20, Paul, again, talking to the same group of people, he says, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in word, but power. We have tried to make this thing into word when God said, no, I want to show my power. I mean, how many, how many people make a decision about what church to go to based upon the preacher? I mean, really, how many people make a decision about where to plug in and to go to church based upon, um, upon the teaching that they received in that church? I've heard, of people, I've heard of people leaving a church before because they didn't feel like they were getting fed. So I'm not getting fed at that church. I mean, you might as well have a, a t-shirt on that says, I'm a lazy Christian, if that's your excuse. If you say, oh, I'm not getting fed, you're a lazy Christian. Stop waiting on somebody to cram stuff down your throat and go home and get in your Bible for yourself. But here's the bottom line. You didn't come here for a preacher. You didn't come here for a message. You came here for God. You didn't come into this building because I'm going to persuade you with smooth words. You came in here not to be entertained, but to be overcome, to be conquered, to to find Him and to submit and yield our lives completely to Him. That's what 
we need. That's what we need. More, more so than any preaching, more so than any of the stuff. Listen, I, I read a, a scripture to my children last night as in, our, in our time, our family devotion time together, and it was talking about how, how we need preaching. What, because the Bible says that how can they hear if they don't have a preacher? How, how, will, they, how will they hear if they don't have a preacher? But let me tell you something. This preaching is not what's going to bring the power. It's not what's going to bring the, the, the change, the transformation. God is what we're after. This preaching is good, and it's going to help you, and it's going to set you in alignment with the Word of God. And being in alignment with the Word of God, then you can receive what it is that He wants to do in your life. That's all my job is. You know that Ephesians chapter 4 says that He's given gifts to the body of Christ. Some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers and evangelists, and he put them in the body of Christ. We call it the five-fold ministry. And God places these gifts in the body of Christ. They are men and women that are placed in the body of Christ for this reason, the Bible says, to bring to, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. I had my mind blown one time when I was doing a word study on that particular verse. And I started looking up each, each word. And you know I like to do that sometimes. But that word equipping, it, it, it can mean equipping like a soldier is equipped with armor. And a soldier is equipped with weaponry and, and provisions that he needs to go out and to do what he needs to do. But, but ultimately the first definition for that Greek word that's used there for equipping, you know what it means? It means alignment. My primary responsibility in the body of Christ is to get us into alignment with God's purposes. For the alignment for the work of the ministry. Because if you're out of alignment with God's word, then your work for the, for the Lord is going to be hindered. You hear what I'm telling you? My job is not to pet people. It's not to entertain people. It's not to make people feel better. My job in the body of Christ is to bring alignment, is to bring us into focus, is to bring us into alignment with God's purpose. And I'm telling you, His purpose can only be accomplished with His power. So He's given apostles and prophets, pastors and teachers and evangelists, and He's placed us in an authority to bring alignment to the body of Christ. And that's what's happening right here this morning. There's alignment coming to your life. There's alignment. There's alignment coming to your life. There's alignment coming to this church. There's alignment coming to your family. I just declare it even, even wider than that. There's alignment coming to this region. I had a dream not last night, but the night before, I, I've been dreaming like crazy, and I'm not a, I'm not a dreamer. I, don't, I have dreams, but I, I, I've, I rarely have dreams. It's not something that usually happens to me. I had a dream night before last, and I won't tell you the details of the dream because I don't know that the Lord's released me to do that yet, but I'll tell you this much. There was, the Lord was giving me a glimpse into a spiritual reality, and the Lord allowed me to see a, a spiritual, a, 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 a gathering of principalities. If you're, if you're in, if you're with me today, this won't, this won't go by you. Just, just receive it, okay? If, I, want, I need you to hear this. The Lord allowed me to see in my dream a gathering, a council, this is the only way I need to describe it, a council of principalities that are governing this region. And he allowed me to see them in, in convening in a meeting. And I was in the meeting and I began to see some of the process of the way that they were doing some things. And, and, and one of the things that, that the Lord allowed me to see was that there was a, a leader that's being raised up in, and, uh, and there was authority given to this leader to be a prophetic voice in this region. And I, I immediately heard the clamor and I immediately heard the dissension and I immediately heard the negativity of the voices of these principalities where there was disagreement amongst the, the principalities because they did not want this person being given the authority to speak the destiny of God over this region. And the Lord showed me the next thing I was outside of this building, this place where these people, where these principalities were meeting together. 
And I was outside and he began to show me the characteristics and the nature of these principalities that are there. This is, this is real. You say, well, how do, why, what, what is that all about, Pastor? Well, why? It's a governmental thing. It's about alignment. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Influence and power and authority are things that the kingdom is meant to be producing in the lives of believers to change the world. And the kingdom of God is not subject to the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God is over the, the rulers, the principalities and the powers of this world. And the kingdom of God is desiring, it is the desire and the will of God to establish something new and fresh in this region to win people, to change the culture and the atmosphere. There's some things that have got to shift, and I just need you to know, if, you're, if you are okay with things being the status quo, if you're okay with things being as they are, then you are in agreement with a strategy. You are in agreement with a strategy of hell. And it's time for us to come out of agreement with the world. And align ourselves up in agreement. There's power in agreement. Listen to me. When two or more gather and they agree, they, as touching anything, the Bible says it will be established. And so I, I believe God's looking for some people in this region, in this community, in Slack County, in this, in this territory. He's looking for some people to come into agreement with his purpose. To come into alignment. Remember I said this earlier. To come into alignment with the assignments of angels. We've, we've had angelic visitation even in this building and on this property why do you think they were here why do you think they were here? some of you don't believe that right now you're in alignment with the devil you better come out of that that's the, that's a lie that's a lie and if you agree with that lie then you're deceived they've been here they're here now and they're wanting to do God's purpose but you know what they're waiting on somebody to come in agreement with God's plan so that the doors can be flung open Listen, God will not kick the door open and say, here you go, guys. He's waiting on somebody on the earth to come into agreement with him. We say, well, how do we do that? Well, first, you're going to have to hear what he wants you to be in agreement with. You're going to have to know what's on his heart. And when you begin to see the Father's heart for this region, for this community, come on, this is, this is some heavy stuff this morning. When you begin to see it, when you begin to feel it and sense it, that, that the Father's heart, you will, you will all of a sudden see things in, in our community and see things in our region that need to change that maybe have never occurred to you that need to change. And the reason they've never occurred to you is because the devil just put us to sleep and made us think everything was okay and it just needs to stay the way it is. No, I'm telling you, there needs to be an, an upheaval of some things. There needs to be a, a, some things turned over. And there's all kinds of words, and listen, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but there's people that have spoken words even, even, even about me and personally about my family and about my wife and have spoken things that, that we're, we're just not okay with the status quo. No, we're not. No, we're not. If we were okay with the status quo, we would have never come here. If, if, if we didn't desire to see God turn this place upside down, we would have never stepped foot in this city. But the bottom line is, is that God has a desire to change things. And if we're not willing to change, if we don't want change, if we're scared of change, then we've come into an agreement with an opposing force. And, and let me just tell you, I you say, oh, I'm a blood washed believer. You can still be in opposition to God. And that's a dangerous place to be. I don't care how many Bible verses you know or how long you've been in church. If you're in opposition to the will of God. You are in dangerous territory. And some of you right now are trying to write this off like I'm just talking out of my head, but I'm telling you right now, the authority in this building is here to set things right. And if you're unwilling to receive that, then that's on you, not on me. So Exodus chapter 32 I know, I said that about 30 minutes ago. 
God brought his people out of Egyptian bondage and slavery, and then he begins a process of taking them through the wilderness to change them, to shape them, to mold them, to recreate them. He had to teach them fundamentally how to be kings and priests, how to be a, 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 a holy people. He had to teach them in the wilderness how to live, how to do life. These people have been slaves. They were slaves. Their whole lives, they were slaves. Their daddies were slaves. Their mamas were slaves. Their granddaddies were slaves. Everybody in their, their line that they could have possibly had any contact with only knew slavery. And God brings them out of slavery and he brings them into the wilderness to prepare them for the promise. So God takes them into the wilderness and he begins to show them his ways. He begins to teach them about how to live and he begins to show them, he begins to put conviction in their heart. Many of you are thankful for convictions. I mean, you need to be, if you're not, you need to be thankful for convictions because conviction is the only thing that keeps you out of hell. Amen. You need to thank God that there is something tied to you called conviction. We was having a, a, a family meeting the other night and I was sitting down and my daughter had a conviction that hit her all of a sudden out of nowhere. And I, and I, I, I know she probably don't want me talking about this, but I'm so, I'm so proud of her in this because it convicted me. You need to listen, you need to, listen to the voice of your children. I, that thing drives me crazy. You need to listen to the convictions that God puts even in the hearts of your children because they matter. And she said, you know, Dad, she said, uh, she said, I just noticed, she said, you know, we, we occasionally, you know, we, we all do it. She wasn't, she wasn't pointing to anybody, but she was just saying, we, you know, we all do it. But, but um, I, I just thought about something. She said, you know, we've, we've used the term just, just pretty casually before, holy cow. I've said it when I was preaching before. You've heard me say it. Holy cow. She said, she just got to thinking about that and how that was probably a reference to a, a cow that, that we read about in the scripture. It reminded her of this passage of scripture right here, Exodus 32. And, and all of a sudden, conviction fell on all of us. And we're sitting there talking about, why, why do we just say phrases like, holy cow? Where does that come from? I mean, do we even, do we even know? Do we, do we even, are, are we even aware that, that the word holy can only be attributed to God? You, do you know that in heaven that the Bible says that there are six-winged creatures covered in eyeballs that are flying around the throne of God? So tell me that this thing's not weird, man. I'm telling you, if you go to a church and you're too comfortable, then, you know, you need to read about the God that has six-winged creatures, okay? Because God, God's got some weird stuff going on. Why does he have six-winged creatures with eyeballs? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's God, right? If he wants six-winged creatures with eyeballs all over them, then there you go. That's what he got. Amen. And, and the Bible says that day and night for eternity past and eternity future, day and night, night and day, they do not cease. They, all the time, this is, all, this is what they do. They say, holy, holy, holy. You know, like the, the, the good Christian definition of holiness is, is right, like without sin, right? I mean, like if I was going to ask you, what, well, what is holiness? You might say, well, holiness means that we don't sin. Holiness means that, that it's, they're, not, they're not up in heaven, though, going, you don't sin, you don't sin, you don't sin. That's not what they're doing in heaven. They're not celebrating the fact that God doesn't sin. You know what they're celebrating? The fact that there is none other like him. Holy does not just mean that you don't sin. Holy means you are set apart. You're different. You're unlike anything else that we've ever seen. Holy, holy, holy. You are unbelievable. The holiness of God is more than just the fact that he doesn't sin. The Bible says that he can't sin. He's without temptation. He doesn't sin, he doesn't sin because he can't. It's, a, it's the opposite of his nature not even possible 
And so God doesn't sin, and so he doesn't need us to attribute the fact that he doesn't sin to him. He wants us to understand how set apart he is, how different he is, how holy he is. When we sing songs like we did just a little while ago about holy and we sang his name, Yahweh, do you know that the the, the ancient Hebrews, that they wouldn't even pronounce his name? They wouldn't even say it out loud. And if they did have to write it, that the early scribes, before they would write the name Yahweh, that they would actually have, they would go and bathe and cleanse themselves and then come back and write the name Yahweh. And every time, even if they said it five times in one sentence, every time they came back to write his name again, they went and cleansed themselves because his name is holy. It's not common. It's not casual. And when we throw around the attribute of holiness by attributing it to an animal or worse things, come on, do you hear the deception of the enemy here? What's he want you to do? He wants you to get twisted all in your mind of what you believe about him. And when you get twisted all in your mind, you hear me over there? He wants you to get twisted all in your mind about what you think about him. And if you allow that to happen in your life, you are wide open to come into alignment with the enemy's plan in your life. That's the reason why people are so screwed up because they've forgotten who he is. They don't know him. They think he's just, a, they think he's just some force or some being in the sky that if they even believe that much. He's holy, he's set apart, he's different. He's altogether different from anything else that we could ever even imagine. And so the people of God are are now gathered at Mount Sinai and Moses goes up on the mountain to speak with God. God calls to him and the, the, the glory of the Lord, the cloud of fire. The Bible says that the mountain quaked and it was covered in flames and fire and smoke billowed from the mountain. It was a, a terrible sight. The people shook and trembled and cried. Listen, when God shows up, I mean, it's, it's serious. It gets real. So he's there on the mountain, and Moses goes up, and God calls him to the very top of the mountain, and he's going to speak to him there. And he begins to tell him about the, the, the commandments. He begins to give to him uh, the, the instructions for building the tabernacle. Everything Moses would need, listen to this. He was speaking to Moses about everything he would need to bring his people into order and to bring his people into alignment. Do you know that... My responsibility in the body of Christ is the same responsibility that Moses had to bring order and alignment so that we can walk in God's best, so that we can know Him, so that we can experience all that He has for us. That's our job. That's what, and so now, what's, what's the people of God's responsibility? To walk it out in obedience, to stay, to maintain alignment and order so that we can be a blessing to the heart of God, so that we can then see his power and provision brought in, into our lives. He said, I want to make you my own prized possession. Oh, um, uh, there, there, man, there's, there's several places here that I wish I could go. I wish I had time to. Do I just need to... To ditch this thing, or you want me to get the handheld? Yeah. Where is that thing? Make me want to throw that thing. <clears throat> so here we go. Let's just get started here. I'm, I'm going to read this, and this is I, I'm going to be closing here too. So, Exodus 30, 32, verse one. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, uh, for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the, the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. You see, Moses didn't come back down the mountain in a time frame that they thought he would. And so because it took a little bit longer, the people started getting antsy and they said, well, we're going to figure out a way to do this ourselves. Let me just tell you something, guys. Uh, the day that we decide that this is taking too long to get to where God wants us to go and we begin trying to get there ourselves is the day we get into trouble. God has a way, God has an order, God has a plan, and we stick to God's way, God's order, and God's plan. There's something about standing orders in the community of God where we begin to say, God, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on, I don't see exactly how this is all working out, but I know the last thing you told me to do was this, and that's what I'm going to do until you tell me to do something else. 
I'm not going to wander around trying to figure out how to make this happen on my own. I'm just going to do what you told me to do, and I'm going to walk it out with all of my heart. And that's all God's asking for us to do. He shouldn't have to tell us five different times to do the same thing. I mean, how frustrating is that when you tell your children five different times or more to do something, and they're still not doing it? Now, I love my children, but that still frustrates my heart. God loves his children, but it still frustrates his heart. And he's infinitely better than I am. But God knows that you and I need to stay in alignment with what it is he's told us to do. So here's verse 2. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it uh, with an engraving tool and he made a molded calf. And then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You know what they did? They made a calf and they called it Yahweh. How stupid. And here's what's really frustrating. The guy that was supposed to be leading them into his presence, Aaron, is the fool that said, give me the gold and I'm going to make you what you're asking for. Now, it was the people's idea, but he had the authority to shut it down. And he didn't do it. He went along with the people's plan. Let me, let me just go ahead and tell you something. The church that is catering to the desires and whims of the culture is the church that has built a golden calf and has called it Yahweh. When the world said, entertain us, make us happy, give us coffee and some cool music, and we'll show up and we'll pay for it. And, 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 and when leaders bow themselves to the will of people, and they're scared to do what God told them to do because they're scared of what people might do. They're scared people might leave their church. They're scared people might quit tithing. They're scared people are going to cause an uproar. And because they're scared of people, they're not scared of God. There's no fear of the Lord in them. And I, I had a conversation with my wife yesterday that I, it's like, it's like this, I need you to pray for me, man. I need you to pray for me because there is this constant nagging from the enemy to tell me things like, well, if you do that, they're not going to come back. Well, if you do that, they're not, they're not going to want to be there. You, 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 better, you better let them out by 1230 or, or... yeah? I mean, it's, con it's constant. It's constant. And then I, I realized something. When I say, holy cow... I'm actually talking about the unholy church that has created for itself another version of Yahweh. And it has built up for itself another God. And the people of God begin to worship this image. They begin to dance and sing and celebrate. And Aaron, like a dummy, listen to what he says. So when Aaron saw it, verse 5, he built an altar before it. So not only are they going to worship it and sing to it and praise it and, 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 and talk good about it, now they're going to make sacrifices to this thing. He said he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation. And listen to what he said. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So in other words, Aaron's saying, I know that we're doing some stuff that, that really isn't exactly the way we're supposed to be. But we're still going to have a holy feast to the Lord. And we're still going to show up and we're still going to sing the songs and we're still going to pray the prayers and we're going to do the dance. We're going we're gonna to sing the songs. We're going to make a big fuss about this thing. And so you show up and the party's on. Meanwhile, God and Moses are up on the mountain. And God and Moses begin having a conversation. And God says to Moses, he says, Moses, you need to get down from here. And you need to go back down this mountain and you need to go see what it is that these crazy people have begun to do. 
And they, Moses is, is, is already going, oh, well, Lord, my people? These are your people. The, you picked them. They're your, don't say they're my people. They are your people. And God says, I, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe them out, Moses. It's me and you, man. Me and you. Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to destroy them all. And I'm going to start over with just me and you. And from you, I will make a great, the greatest nation that the earth has ever seen. And through you, the line of the Messiah will come. And through you, the, the seed of the promise of God will come into the earth. Through you. And God begins making these promises to, to Moses. And Moses goes, whoa, hold up, God. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And he begins to intercede for the people. And he says, God, you can't do that. God, God, please don't do that. Please do not wipe out these, your people. And, and listen to the reasoning that he begins to give God. And I'll go through this and read it another time to you. But for time's sake this morning, I want to share this with you. He said, he said, God, if you do this and if you wipe them out, then the Egyptians that you just conquered are going to look at you and they're going to say, well, what kind of faithful God is that? He led them out of slavery just to kill them. He let them out of bondage just to destroy them. He said, what, what will, the, what will the, the world think about you? How will the world think about your goodness if, if all they know about you is that when, when things didn't happen the right way, you destroyed all the people? And the Bible says that God relented. That God re relented from the harm that he intended to do to the people. And graciously and lovingly and full of mercy, God sent Moses back down the mountain. Moses had some, some butts to whoop when he got there. He took the golden calf, the holy cow, and he ground it up into powder and he put it in water and he made the people drink it. Is this what you want? Tell me how it tastes. Tell me how it tastes. I think it's important. The reason that Moses took that thing and he made the people drink it, the Bible says to taste and see that the Lord is good. But I'm telling you, if we really got a, a, an accurate taste of what it is that the American church has been feeding the people of God, we would not say that this is good. It's powerless. It's puny. It's, it's without conviction. And, 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 and in, in all actuality, it's idolatry. And it's abomination. God in his mercy spared the people because of the, the, the heart of Moses. Because he loved those people and he really didn't want to bring the harm into their lives. He really wanted to spare them. But he needed somebody... Oh, get this. He needed somebody to come into agreement with his heart. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I don't believe God ever wanted to destroy the people. He already had a plan for our screwed upness. He already had a plan. He was going to send his only son. He was just preparing the way for his son to come. And to die on a cross, to shed his blood so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be right with God, so that the foolishness of our past could be washed away. And Moses stood in a gap, and Moses made up the hedge, and Moses petitioned to God. Moses came into alignment with God's purpose. And because Moses came into alignment with God's purpose, the people of God were spared. And ultimately, they were brought into the promise. There's a, a scripture in John chapter 8 when Jesus is talking about freedom. He says in John 8, 36, he says that it is for freedom. Or if the Son has set you free, the Bible says. He said, then you are free indeed. 
If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Not if the church has set you free or the preaching has set you free or the message. If the Son of God has set you free, then you are free indeed. These people, although had been freed from bondage, they were still slaves to sin. And I want you to know that Jesus is the provision for us to be free and free indeed. He didn't just cancel the debt that you owed. He broke the curse that produced the debt. That's good news, everybody. That's, that's really good news. He didn't just cancel the debt. He broke the curse. What if our church began to live that way? What if we quit turning our eyes to golden calves and we begin to live like God has really set us free? You know, and, and I, I, I understand that some, you know, some people are not as expressive as others. I, I understand that. But at the same time, I know that the excuse of not being an expressive person can also be something to hide behind. And the bottom line is, is that if he set you free, why don't you worship freely? Huh? You hear me? If he set you free, why don't you live in freedom? Why does somebody got to pull you in and, and, and pet you and, 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 and build you up and, and, and come on, stroke you to get you to do something for God? If you're free, why don't you act like you're free? If you still think that, that, that living like Egypt is freedom, man, I'm telling you, you're not free. You're deceived. You're deceived. I, I wonder... I wonder what would happen. I remember when I was a teenager, and I'm, I'm going to close this up, but when I was a teenager, and uh, I, I, I shared part of this story maybe a few weeks ago. I don't know. Maybe it was on the men's trip, but I, I can't remember. But, I, but, but, uh, but one of my first visits uh, to the ramp in Hamilton, Alabama, and I went to the ramp with a couple of buddies of mine, and as I was there in the, in the crowd during the service at night, and this was in the early days of the ramp, and, and uh, it was a Tuesday night, and I had driven uh, up there several hours to be there and, and got there just in time for the service. And a couple of friends of mine went in and we'd never seen anything like it before. We'd never experienced uh, just an intense environment like that in the presence of God before. And it was just something brand new. And so we walked in the doors of the place and went and found us a seat. And all of a sudden worship started going on and, and this and that. And, and, and uh, somewhere in the middle of worship, Miss, uh, Miss Karen Wheaton, she stopped in the middle of the, the, the worship. She came up on the stage and she's, she's looking out like through the lights like this and down at the at the seats and she she's got a microphone and she's looking down I can still see her doing it just right now and she's looking at me and I'm like oh no don't look at me I don't know and I so I'm like slouching down in my chair you know I'm like trying to disappear man because I knew exactly what was about to happen she called me up on the stage y'all she said uh, she said hey you sitting right over there yeah you between the other two guys you come on up here up on the the platform and she called me up on the stage and then she put me up there on the platform and I don't even remember anything else that happened. She began talking and she began prophesying. She began speaking all these things and there were several other pastors there that night. They began to prophesy over my life and, and speak over my life and my, my two buddies, they went up with me and so Jake and, and, and Yogi, I had a friend named Yogi, but anyway, um, my friend Yogi and Jake and one was on one side and one was on the other and then I remember I, I, I just had this moment with the Lord where I was so resisting anything God wanted to do in my life and I was just resisting it resisting it like no this is not this is weird this is uncomfortable this is kind of scary I don't know what's going on here and, and 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 I was just resisting it resisting it and then all of a sudden it felt like a a, a sack full of bricks fell on my forehead about right there and next thing I knew I was laying on the floor and nobody caught me nobody nothing nobody was trying to pick, help me up nobody was worried about me honestly I mean I was right where I was supposed to be evidently I was laid out on the platform for over an hour. And it was, the power of God was coming over me like waves. 
It was like, you ever been at the, the beach and laid just where the waves come in and they just come over you just like that? It was like that and all of a sudden I'd feel it start lifting and I'd start sitting up. I'd try to sit up and I'd get, get about, you know, four, six inches off the floor and then all of a sudden here come another wave. Boom! And it knocked me right back down again. I was laying there on the floor just doing sit-ups. I could feel the power of God just rolling over me like waves. I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't worried anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about what nobody thought about me anymore. I wasn't concerned about everybody's opinion in the room. All of a sudden, I had experienced something that was way beyond my understanding. And I was okay with that. I wasn't laying there trying to figure out, what is this? I wasn't fighting it anymore. I wasn't uh, disputing it anymore. I, I submitted to it and I surrendered to it and I yielded to it. And God did something in my life that night on that stage laying on that floor. I can remember the song they were singing. And I've never been the same since. Probably would not even be standing in front of you today had, not God, had God not touched me in that moment. And, and you say, well, that's weird. Yeah. It is. You know, and, and people won't, well, where is, show me that in the Bible. Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And guess what else it says? He restores my soul. He's a good shepherd. You ever heard that before? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He did that night to me. He made me lie down in green places that I, I was living in a barren place. And he, he laid me down in some green places. And he restored my soul. So I got up finally. My legs was wobbly. And I made my way back to my seat. Well, well first of all, when, when, I, when, I, when, I finally, when I was trying to sit up, I looked over and there was Jake. And then I looked over this way, and there was Yogi. And I didn't know it, but all three of us had just gotten slammed. And so I got up finally and made my way back to my seat. This is at the end of the service now. I had been on the platform for well over an hour for the rest of the worship service and the preaching time. I have no idea what they preached about. I mean, it shows you how concerned God was that I get the message, right? I mean, he laid me out before the message ever started. Because he didn't bring me there for a message. He brought me there for him. Yeah? And so I made my way back to my seat, and I'm thinking, whew, that's crazy. I'm thinking about the phone calls I'm going to have to make on the ride home to explain this to my Southern Baptist pastor, father, and mother who, by the way, were at this time starting to experience some of this stuff themselves. And so it wasn't that big a shocker. I think they had been praying that something like that would happen. And so I go back to my seat and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the leaders there were kind enough to bring, uh, bring me some water. I guess I looked like I needed it. So I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in my chair and I'm sipping on some water and Miss Karen comes down off the stage to the end of the service and the, the worship has kicked back up by now, okay? It's kicked back up and it's rolling. And I'm sitting there in my chair, and Miss Karen comes off the platform. I'm thinking, oh, great, what's going to happen now? She's coming back after me again. She comes to me. She, looks, she, she stands me up from my seat. She grabs my hand, stands me up from my seat, looks me in the eye, and she said, do you want to see your city set free? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, you're going to learn something. And I said, okay, wh what is it? She said, you need to dance. <laughs> I'm, 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 about, I'm about as white boy as they come, right? You know, like, I ain't, I ain't a dancing type. You know, I'll do the little, you know, Holy Ghost bunny hop, you know, but, but I don't know about all this dancing business. And I mean, I'm just... I'm just a little Baptist boy. I don't know nothing about all this stuff, right? I've never seen anything. What? I need to dance. She said, she said, would you dance if, if your dance would set your city free? And I was, I started dancing. 
I started cutting the jig. Man, I was spinning around. I was hopping up and down. I was flailing around all over the place. I looked over. There's Yogi. He's dancing and twirling and spinning all over. I looked over. There's Jake. There he goes. He's dancing, swirling all over the place. And, and the whole place is just like blowing up, man. I mean, just, just it, the, the, the exploding with the power of God. Just, I mean, the excitement and the stirring of God's people just over what was going on. And then, and then all of a sudden, people started calling out the name of the city that I was from. As we're dancing, people are calling out and, and speaking the name of the city where I was from. My buddies and I went back home. And we continued to make trips up there and have, you know, special uh, experiences there and whatever. But we went back home and we started a, a Bible study. We started a, a uh, wasn't even a Bible study. We started a, a, a worship meeting. Our city had, had nothing going on. There was, there was nobody going after God. There was, there was nobody reaching people with the power of God. I mean, none of that stuff's going on at all. I mean, it's just dry as it could be. And people started coming. People started coming to this, this event. We weren't calling it a church. We weren't calling it, a, you know, anything. Just people started coming. And uh, kids that we knew from school, from from our high school, they started coming, and we would we would worship, man, and and we we rented this little building, and it was a, it used to, it had been a bar, it was a bar, it still had the bar in it. It had a bar and it had a cage in it. This is what kind of bar we were in, and we rented a bar, and and filthy. I'm talking about disgusting, nasty. The floor was covered in an inch of just grime and cigarettes and and beer cans and just the foulest stuff you can imagine and we would come in there on Thursday nights and we would worship and I would watch my teenage peers from my high school I would watch them crawl around in that nasty floor on their face before God they would leave there covered in soot tear streams down their face in soot on their face The Lord later called all of us out of that place except for one of my, the guys that was there with me that night. And there was nothing going on in that city. And I'm, I'm telling you today that today, right now, there is a church in revival in that city that didn't exist back then. And the guy who was laying next to me on the floor that was dancing for that city is, the, is one of the worship leaders in that church. And God is doing what it is he said he's going to do. And that night, I'm telling you, are you free? Are, then why don't we worship freely? Why don't we worship as if, uh, as if we're really doing it for God and not for anybody else or, or concerned about what anybody else thinks? I was sitting there going, you want me to dance? Are you sick? What do you mean dance? What, everybody's going to think I'm crazy. No, dance. You want to see your city free? Then you need to be free. You want to see your family free? Then you need to get free. We want to see this city free? We need to get free. We've been bowing down to a bunch of golden cows, and I'm telling you, God's calling us to freedom. He's calling us to freedom. Amen? You hear the word of the Lord this morning?